Let's get back to work. Session 3.2. Session 3.2 will focus on flip-flops. Subject outcome 2.4. Topic 2 of the level 2 curriculum is a problem for many lecturers. In fact, many leave it out altogether when teaching because they themselves do not understand the content well enough to be able to teach it to their students. However, it comprises 35% of the course in terms of weighting, and the knowledge gained in level two is essential for when students proceed to levels three and four. If they do not understand the basics when they are in level two, they will struggle for the rest of the course. Therefore, it is up to you, level two lecturers, to ensure that they understand the content of topic two inside and out. Unfortunately, we do not have time in this basic introductory course to go through the whole of topic two in detail. However, we will go through an explanation of subject outcome 2.4, flip-flops and their truth table. Students struggle to understand flip-flops, but as we saw in our ECDE flow diagram, they need a good grasp of this section if they are to cope with sinusoidal and non-sinusoidal oscillators when they reach level 4. Discussion on flip-flops Take a few minutes now to break into groups and discuss with your colleagues how you usually go about teaching subject outcome 2.4. Then share your insights with the group as a whole. This will be managed by your facilitator. When a discussion about computers takes place, or when you are deciding to buy a new computer, a common question that always arises is, how much RAM does it have? Everyone knows that a lot of RAM is a good thing, but what is RAM? RAM is an acronym for Random Access Memory, a type of computer memory that can be accessed randomly. This means each individual byte in memory can be accessed directly and without interfering with other bytes. RAM is found in servers, personal computers, tablets, smartphones, and many other devices such as printers and so on. RAM, ROM, read-only memory, hard disk drives, flash drives, and so on, all have the ability to store information in the form of bits and bytes. The word bits is short for binary digits. A binary digit has a value of either 0 or 1. A byte is simply a sequence of 8 bits. So, how is it possible for a computer to store information that you can access whenever you want to? The answer is that it uses circuit components called flip-flops. Flip-flops are the basic building block that makes computer memory possible. Let us look at how a flip-flop works. The name flip-flop refers to the ability of a circuit to remain in one of two stable states. The input pulse, also known as a trigger, sets one state for the flip-flop. The flip-flop can remain this way indefinitely. In other words, it stores information. The next input pulse resets the flip-flop to the opposite state, which is also stable. The two opposite states are stable conditions because an input pulse is needed to change the level in the output. Therefore, the flip-flop is a bistable device. And it operates in a similar way to a bistable multivibrator circuit. Flip-flops are important in logic circuits because they have this memory characteristic where the circuit holds the conditions in the output for each pulse in the input until the next pulse arrives. Note that logic gates on their own do not have this kind of memory. There are many different types of flip-flops. For example, SR or RS for set reset, RS master slave, D type for data delay, T type for toggle, JK, JK simulated using RS flip-flops. In this short tutorial, we will only discuss the SR and JK type of flip-flops. 
we will start with SR flip-flops. Just two interconnected logic gates make up the basic form of the circuit, whose output has two stable output states, as stated previously. When the circuit is triggered into either one of these states by a suitable input pulse, it will remember this state until it is changed by further input pulse or until the power to the circuit is removed. For this reason, the circuit may also be called a bistable latch. The SR flip-flop is a one-bit memory since it stores the input pulse even after it has passed. Flip-flops of different types can be made from logic gates and, as with other combinations of logic gates, the NAND and NOR gates are the most versatile. The NAND gate is the most widely used when making flip-flop circuits. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, the NAND gate can be made to simulate any of the other standard logic functions. And secondly, it is also cheaper to construct. The SR, set reset, flip-flop is one of the simplest sequential circuits and consists of two NAND gates interconnected as shown in the figure on the screen. Notice that the output of each gate is connected to one of the inputs of the other gate, creating a form of positive feedback or cross-coupling. The circuit has two active low inputs marked S and R, not being indicated by the bar above the letter, as well as two outputs Q and Q. We will now look at the operation of the SR flip-flop. If the R bar and S bar inputs are both set to logic 0, both outputs Q and Q bar go to a logical 1. This is called an invalid state for a flip-flop and is not used. Applying an input logic of 1 to R bar and 0 to S bar, the Q output is set to logical 1. This is called the set condition. If R bar and S bar are set to logic 0 and 1 respectively, the output of Q is reset to 0. This is known as the reset condition. If S bar and R bar are both set to logic 1, the Q and Q bar outputs are left in their previous states. This is known as the hold condition. We will now move on to the JK flip-flop. The JK flip-flop is also called a programmable flip-flop because using its inputs J and K, it can be made to simulate the action of any of the other types of flip-flops. This is the reason why it is widely used in all logic applications pertaining to memory. The figure on screen shows an example of a typical JK flip-flop. We will now look at the operation of the JK flip-flop. As a starting point, assume that both J and K are at logic 1 and that output Q equals 0 and output Q bar equals 1. This will cause NAND 1 to be enabled as it has logic 1 on 2, J and Q bar, of its three inputs, requiring only a logic 1 on its clock input to change its output state to logic 0. At the same time, NAND2 is disabled because it only has one of its inputs, K, at logic 1. Its feedback input is at logic 0 because of the feedback from Q. On the arrival of a clock pulse, the output of NAND1 therefore becomes logic 0 and causes the flip-flop to change state so that Q equals 1 and Q bar equals 0. This action enables NAND2 and disables NAND1. Let's look at a few problems with the simple circuit. As this change of state at the outputs occurs, problems do arise. If the clock pulse is still high, when the flip-flop changes state, the output of NAND2 will instantly go to logic 0, and the flip-flop will reset back to its original state. This can then set up a situation where the flip-flop will rapidly oscillate, move back and forth, between its two states. This problem caused by the output data 
racing round the feedback lines from output to input before the end of the clock pulse is called a race hazard and must be avoided. The problem can be avoided by using a more complex version of the circuit called the JK Master Slave flip-flop. We will not discuss the circuit here as it is beyond the scope of level 2. This session will conclude with a few brief closing remarks. The main aim of this short tutorial was to discuss what electronic circuits and components are used to retain memory in computer systems, smartphones, and so on. Just by analyzing two of the various types of flip-flops, it is evident that logic gates, which are constructed from transistors, play a crucial role in obtaining this objective. Just as an example, by 2016, the largest transistor count in a commercially available single integrated circuit processor, such as the Pentium 4, was over 7.2 billion, all switching at speeds unimaginable to us. It is through this high-speed switching that computers work to store information, pictures, videos, movies, and photographs. It is now evident that a good understanding is required of how these and other electronic components work so that we can understand the complexities of modern circuits and how they are used to manufacture the electronic equipment that we take for granted. End of module.